Bransfield. Imagine a game where you could go anywhere, do anything, be anyone. Frontier Elite 2 was not, not that game. And given we live in the now rather than the then, that being 1993 in the case of Frontier, it means we're surrounded by games where you can do a lot more than you could in David Braben's spacefaring classic. There's even a modern sequel to the series, so Frontier quite obviously isn't the best the series would ever get. Plus, the clue being in the name Elite 2, this one was already a sequel, so wasn't breaking completely new ground to begin with. So in Frontier Elite 2, you weren't free to do anything. The game has aged a lot. It's been hugely surpassed in the near 30 years since its release, and it was never actually that new an experience to begin with. Glad we could clear that up. But still, imagine a game where you could go anywhere, do anything, be anyone. Frontier Elite 2 might not have actually been that game, but it sure as hell felt like it back when I was pootling around the universe in the mid-90s on my Amiga 500. It was so inconceivably vast, literally billions of star systems to explore, countless planets to land on, battles to be had, goods to be traded, mining to be done, ships to be upgraded. It stepped up what the original Elite offered in almost every way and was an absolute classic experience and the sort of thing that indelibly marks your very being when you played it in your younger years. It's the sort of thing that makes you put this massive star map up on your wall and have it there for years because goddamn you were a cool kid who everyone loved. <clears throat> so yeah, Frontier Elite 2 ended up releasing from 1993 on, coming to Amiga, Atari ST, PC, and eventually CD32. There were differences, better textures on PC, fewer colours on ST, a choppy mess or a less choppy mess on Amiga, depending on whether you were playing on an A500 or A1200, but really nothing much between the versions. The CD32 fixed most bugs and introduced a targeting computer that made it easier to choose where you were going though, which made it the best version. Not my words, the words of the man who created the entire Elite series, David Braben. Yes friends, I spoke to him back in 2018, interviewing him for a feature that never actually came to anything. Given it's just been sitting there unused for four years, I figured I'd root through it and get some of the actual creator's input into this random video about the game because... Why not, eh? Frontier, as in the game developer, didn't come to be until development on the game of the same name had wrapped, which leads nicely into Braben saying this. The first product Frontier had was the CD32 version of Elite 2. I think it was one of the best ones. It had the navigation computer. I wish I'd put it in the base game, the target selection, so you could very quickly choose your destination. That was very nice. I liked that. There were no other official versions of Elite 2 over the years, but there was GL Frontier, a reverse engineered version of the game based on the Atari ST incarnation with some visual overhauls and made to work on modern PCs. It was a homemade project and, as far as I'm aware, was never finished, but it works and it's a neat little experiment. The neater experiment for me was Frontier 1337, Leet though, which piggybacked off the GL Frontier port and made a version of the original game for the PSP. If I'd have known this existed years ago, I'd have been... happy. Just, just very happy. But for this video specifically, I played the Amiga version, notably the Amiga 1200 version running at 60Hz. As you can see from this brief comparison of the intro sequence, it runs a tad quicker and smoother than the Amiga 550Hz version I grew up with. What a brave future this is we live in. I care. And let's now go into some chat as to why. Frontier inhabits a weird space in space, in that the space it filled was a weird mix of the next step for video games combined with a technological platform that looked a bit shoddy by 1993 standards. We had fully textured 3D games by that point, on PC at least, so Frontier popping up with its flat shaded polygons and choppy frame rate blew few away at release. 
It hadn't helped at all that the game had initially been planned for 8-bit systems, or that it had taken around 5 or so years to come to fruition. As Braden told me, one of the things I did, which was a real shame, was I did all the graphics first. Got them working, and I was delighted. You could read paragraphs of text on the side of spaceships, textures... In 88, that would have blown people away. But by the time the game came out, it just looked okay. But pushing through those limitations, working your way past the fact that, in all honesty, Frontier was a pretty boring game, you would soon realise this was a special package. A special experience that could engross the holy hell out of you should you give it half a chance. It was a slow burn and progress could be glacial, but that payoff when you finally scraped enough together to pick up a slightly better ship than the one you'd been ferrying grain, robots and farm machinery around in, well, it was a great feeling. I would have known this sooner in my life had I not been a child when first playing Frontier though, because in being a child and having no patience, I determined the best way to play the game was to simply exploit a bug and cheat my way to the game's biggest, most expensive ship, the Panther Clipper. This behemoth was capable of carrying hundreds upon hundreds of tons of cargo, passengers, weaponry and more. Once you had that, you could take on the universe with relative ease. Or you'd spend a while getting free money by trying to sell your ship with a passenger on it, the aforementioned bug, only to be met with a complete lack of people looking for work as crew when you did finally purchase the Panther. No crew, no takeoff. No takeoff, no interstellar trading, battling and exploration. It was a cheat with one minor drawback, it seems. Sodding off the sell your ship with a passenger on it bug, I would of course move on to another bug slash cheat for quick and easy fun. This bug saw a click of a phantom jettison rubbish button add an extra ton of space to your cargo hold, meaning even a lowly Viper defense craft could hold the biggest of weapons. So long as you click the invisible button enough. A fine, funny way to take on the game, no doubt. Eh, Except for when you do it and actually it just ends up breaking your ship and then you shoot your gun by accident and the police kill you. Hmm. Which would be the point I'd pivot to the honest route, playing the game how it was intended to be played and without taking advantage of any bugs or cheats. No, this would be the boring route, trading from Barnard Star to our home here in Seoul, on repeat, for hours in the real world and years in the game world. It was the safest route, no risk of being attacked, but with that came slow, slow profits to be made. A slow build, each upgrade earned was a delight. Each hyperdrive switched out for a lighter, more efficient military drive, a joy. And each time I forgot to pay a fine for accidentally smuggling in radioactives, a byproduct of that military drive I mentioned, and getting a game over, a... well... yeah... What else could I do? I could pivot back to the dodgy route of taking advantage of another bug, this one in the system I won't pronounce properly, semis, semis, whatever. There, that, that place. In this system you would find precious metals and gemstones were for some reason illegal. Not only that, but if you contacted an illicit trader, and if they weren't the police waiting to catch you out, you'd be paid a big wadge of cash to take those precious metals and gemstones away. From there it was one of two options, leave to another system to sell them on for even more money, or, my favourite option, flying away from the planet you were paid to take them away from, dumping them in space, turning back around and going back to stock up on more. This would have been a perfect little example of taking full advantage of one of the game's many peculiarities were it not for the fact I dumped some of those metals too close to the planet and got in trouble for it. And, even though I'd immediately paid the fine imposed by space wire transfer, every single bloody copper in the system came hurtling my way, I couldn't escape to another system as I'd used up all my cargo space for illegal goods rather than fuel, and I ended up very much dead. What a bloody game. Okay, so why I love Frontier Elite 2. This time without random failure. I'd save up for a decent ship, I'd arm it up to the gills, I'd shield it up even more so, and I'd put a crap load, which 
is an official measurement of fuel into the cargo hold before heading out into the random, anarchy-riddled systems looking for a fight or ten. Only to not encounter anything at all, because of course. Ah, but this is where Frontier was ever reliable, because soon enough things picked up and I'd be fighting a dozen enemy craft one after the other. They'd appear, I'd pause the game, find out where they were coming in from, target them, set my autopilot on, press play, and let nature take its course. Which usually meant me blasting them, but also often meant them crashing into me because self-preservation wasn't strong in these Nimrods, whereas my shields were. It was a lovely game, but there were some things I got badly wrong, like flight mechanics. Braben said to me, Bransfield, this, this person talking now. I wish I'd spent more time on that. We did flight mechanics first on Elite Dangerous. Most flight dynamics you end up with ships just stopping and shooting, or continuing flying past each other like jousting, which is pretty dull. You probably have half a second to try and shoot them. That ends up pretty frustrating as you try to spend most of your time looping around trying to see them in the sky again. Frontier did end up as jousting, it did end up as just points in the sky. And this would continue for a long time regardless, because the elite system, your combat effectiveness ranking, would rise so very slowly. But as it increased you get access to more dangerous missions, including assassination contracts. Which you won't see any footage of here because I didn't do any while playing to record this, Soz. But hey, what a damn fine, dodgy combat system it was. What else? Well, I, I did a manual docking procedure. That was pretty exciting. On my way to Samis in order to save for the aforementioned... Wait, did I say save? I meant cheat. I was on my way to cheat for the aforementioned decent ship to become a scourge of piracy across the galaxy, but got attacked. Rather than immediately rabbiting, I went to take this enemy on, except I'd forgotten I didn't have a gun. So it was, I took some damage, which resulted in my atmospheric shielding and autopilot being put out of use. I was able to jump away to safety in Sol, but then needed to manually make my way to a space station and dock. No autopilot meant all the flying had to be done by hand, and no atmospheric shielding meant the easier landing on a planet option was off the table. But I did it. It worked. I docked and got everything repaired. And I then realised, as far as I can remember, I've never actually done that before. Manually piloting all the way into a space station dock. Even now, nearly 30 years later, I'm still doing new things in Frontier. And that's nice. I spent some time playing about with another bug, wormholes, wherein you choose a destination around 650 light years from where you are and see you can get there easily. Utilising the magic of triangulation, this meant you could make actual useful jumps from one system to another in two or three instead of half a dozen, saving a lot of fuel in the process. Thing was, I didn't bother with any triangulation and instead ended up lost and out of fuel in a system nobody lived in. You know, the, the usual sort of thing. Or maybe what made me love Frontier the most was discovering how to land on planets. Mining rigs could be set up, exploiting the natural resources the universe had to offer, which could of course then be sold for hard cash money. What this resulted in was a few crashes straight into a planetoid, because Frontier is nothing if not consistent in its idiocy. Eventually, I did the manual route on my way to Saturn's moon Rhea, landing successfully, eventually, and deploying a mining machine to suck all that precious goodness out of the surface. Only to remember that this was indeed Sol, where the vast majority of people in the universe lived, and every single rocky surface in the system had been thoroughly exploited already. Ah, uh, interplanetary strip mining. What a game. I need to stop this now or I'll lose another week playing this nonsense. It's quite ridiculous just how engrossing I can find Elite 2, even with all its issues, even with its lack of direction, even with the fact that it is, objectively speaking, all a bit empty. 
Ah, there we go. I'll, I'll probably do first encounters at some point in the future because I'm kind like that. Thanks to my Fiverr and above tier patrons who help me feel some comfort in this cold and loving expanse of a universe. And massive thanks to my higher tier patrons who I'm sure would help me crew my Panther Clipper should I ever end up owning one in real life. Paintball Magazine PBM Lola Osman Takara Hoshi I'm off to shoot a rock orbiting Mars to cheatily upgrade my elite rating. And in the game, bye!